All right, we are live. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Paige Gross. I am a technically reporter based out of Philadelphia. I'm actually in our HQ for, for the first time in a while today. Um, but I just wanted to give a moment to say hi and thanks to our panelists. Um, Steven, you want to kick it off and introduce yourself and then we can kind of go around? Um, yeah. So uh, my name is Stefan Arstall. I'm the founder and CEO of Tower Paddleboards. Uh, we've now expanded into Tower Electric Bikes and a few different Tower Beach Club. We have an events center as well. Um, we were funded by Mark Cuban on Shark Tank in 2012. We're one of his best investments in the history of the show. Um, we were the number one fastest growing company in San Diego in 2014, fastest growing private company. And then we were number 239 on the Inc. 500 in 2015. So we had this and we're still a very small company. So we tend to do about a million in revenue per employee headcount. And so we started out as a one person company. We mm -hmm. got up to about 10 um, Then the company started to decline again. Um, we, uh, we shrunk and then down to about three people. And now we're growing it back again. In the middle there, we uh, moved the whole company to a five hour workday, cool. uh, working 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. straight through with no lunch. Um, there were a lot of good things that came out of that, but it also killed uh, sort of the, the startup company culture that we had. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was part of our downturn. And now we're trying to regrow the company culture um, to back to what we had, which was uh, very healthy. Yeah, I would love to hear more about the motivation for the shorter work day um, in a bit. Sure. Lisa? Sure. Thanks, Paige. My name is Lisa First Willis. I'm the CEO and co founder of Trevelop. We are an HR tech startup in Baltimore City in Maryland. Um, I spent the last 25 years in HR, which ultimately led, down, led me down the path of starting my own HR technology startup. Um, the, uh, I think for, from my perspective, from a growth perspective, um, I've worked in a lot of different environments over the years. Um, I've helped pre-IPO companies grow from 20 employees to um, 500 in a matter of six months. Um, so I've definitely seen that growth on the inside from an HR perspective. Um, a little bit more about our company, Trevelop. So we were actually um, a, a recipient of the Realist Startup um, Awards in uh, Baltimore in 2020. And we've consistently been growing, adding customers month over month. Uh, we are very passionate about improving manager and employee relationships which has a direct impact on culture. Mm -hmm. um, and our HR technology specifically provides companies with a modern, efficient approach to performance management and development. And we do that through continuous evaluation and real-time feedback, mm -hmm. all of which again, ties back um, really well into culture. For sure, thanks. Yep. Awesome, I guess I'm the last one left. Uh, so hi everyone, my name is Rafi Aladina. I am a consultant with a company called Frost Included. Uh, and actually we are rebranding as of Monday to just include it. Uh, and um, our company is a small startup scale up company as well. Um, we're, uh, as of October of last year, we were about uh, five full-time people we are now 14, so building yeah. quickly, I guess. But our company works with other companies. We're a B2B business and we just and we help organizations build inclusive cultures. Uh, whether that's through strategy development or um, gathering data and analyzing data on not just diversity, but quantitative inclusion data mm -hmm. um, through to embedding uh, more effective and inclusive leadership behaviors mm -hmm. and uh, trying to create nudges for more inclusive processes and systems mm -hmm. uh, that organizations go through. So while our company is small, uh, a lot of what we do is working with organizations to build and maintain inclusive cultures. Yeah. That has a lot of positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think often startups and small companies that are undergoing growth feel like inclusion and equity and those kinds of issues are something to wait until they've already gotten big. Yeah. And I think that that's not the right way to go. And we've seen some real success when those companies are really focusing on inclusion as they grow. Yeah. 
That's a great uh, point to jump off on. I think um, I'm curious, well, so, some of you are in the actual business of culture, so that's interesting. But um, all of you are very early on, if not starting your own companies. And so I'm curious about when that first thought of, okay, we're actually moving into like company mode here. That means we have to start thinking about like the HR practices and just what it means to work at this company, what the culture is. Do, can any of you share that moment when like, oh, it's time, it's time to start thinking about it? Um, I'm happy to jump in on that page. So I think it starts from day one. I think when you get ready to hire your first employee, um, understanding and being able to describe our company mm -hmm. and what we do, what we're passionate about and what we believe in is really important because mm -hmm. you know when you're going through that hiring process, you're going to pick the company that you are inspired by and mm -hmm. that the culture of that company is a place where you feel like you'll fit and that you can grow and develop there. So from the first employee hire, that's when that culture really needs to be defined so you can sell it. And then you can embed that in all of your marketing, all of your communications. So it can really become part of your brand. Yeah. I mean, I'll chime in there, uh, you know, as a startup, we started in 2010 and I don't think we really gave company culture a thought, I would say until about 2015. Yeah. When we really wow. started the five hour workday, like my first employee, I mean, we were just trying to keep up with stuff and I was, you know, job hunting on the side, mm -hmm. like trying to, my other business was failing. Mm -hmm. And so I, my first person that I hired, I said, your, your first job is to figure out how to hire yourself mm -hmm. because I don't need to deal with any of that paperwork. And then just, we just sort of evolved from there and tried to, it was like riding a wild horse kind of. And uh, so to get up to a point where we really thought, started thinking about company culture was, okay, we're, you know, we're a five person company. We're doing about 5 million in revenue here. We have a chance to actually make a big brand. Mm -hmm. uh, and so how do we go from being um, this small, small sort of scrappy startup to being an enduring brand? Mm -hmm. And what do you, what do you need to do? Okay. Well, you've kind of got to live your company culture. Okay. What is our company culture? Mm -hmm. So we started having to backtrack to define all of that stuff because we felt we were going to be stuck as this sort of small, just fighting to survive company without any really sort of planning. Um, so that's really when we did it about five years in. When So since you, have, since you were a couple of years in, did you find yourself when it was time to start addressing whatever company culture was, were you looking at what you had been doing or did you kind of think aspirationally, like this is what I wish it was? Well, I think our, our company culture emanated from what we did. We were a beach lifestyle company. So we were selling stand up paddle boards and we were selling them direct to consumer. Mm -hmm. So we were kind of a tech company and using a lot of internet marketing, but we were also attracted a lot of people that were surfers and stuff like that. So that was sort of our default, uh, you know, company culture. Mm -hmm. And then we just sort of looked at what we were and we were, you know, most of the kids, people I was hiring were young kids right out of school because we didn't need any training because everything we were, used, we were learning was basically new stuff. So I wanted people in learning mode. And then I had been an entrepreneur for maybe 15 years um, and I was very productivity uh, focused. You have to be that way to sort of survive as an, as an entrepreneur. So we were a very productivity, productivity tools focused company. And so that's kind of really where our... Um, our identity came from and the, the five hour work, they really fit our brand. It was sort of a work hard, play hard type thing with this beach lifestyle. Uh, mm -hmm. thing. But when we went to that, we, we actually lost a little of the company culture because now we're walking out the door at one o'clock every day. And instead of working like in a startup where you're working in the trenches with everybody, and yeah. very mm -hmm. strong bonds, all of a sudden work is just this thing you do before noon to afford yourself this great lifestyle, which was great for the employees but it broke the company culture. And uh, about two years into that experiment, uh, I lost half of the company within like a 90 day period. And I'm mm. like, that's crazy. The whole wow. reason we rolled that out was to attract and retain these people. And it didn't work for that, which was somewhat of a surprise. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I'm sure that that was a, like you felt like, okay, this is just a risk and we're gonna have to take it and see if it works. Yeah, and it was an experiment. We, we, we only did it as a three month experiment to start, but it worked so well. The mm -hmm. productivity was, was great. Our revenues were up like 50% that first year. Yeah. Uh, but there were some things that didn't work with it for sure. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, I like this question that Chris um, called out in the chat. He said, I wonder, I always wonder how possible it is for founders to really accurately get their values from day one. And I agree with that, Chris. Um, doesn't that stuff change once you've been out in the world? Um, so yeah, if you're, it's you and two, you know, co-founders, you're probably not going to have the same values once you have you know, 15 other people, 30 other people on board, and they're all bringing their own sense of like what's important to them to the table as well. Um, mm -hmm. So for those who have, you know, really, you know, for, you started from the beginning, how has your values and culture changed over time? Rafi, if you want to take this Yeah, one. I mean, yeah. I think, <laughs> thanks. Um, well, I think one of the, so one of the things that I think is often difficult is like, not just identifying what is our culture, but what do you mean by the word culture? What is culture? How is it built? And um, there's uh, Bob Diamond, the former CEO of Barclays Bank, he was indicted for corruption and stuff like that. But when he was giving his testimony to British Parliament, he said this one phrase that has always stuck with me, which is culture is what you do when nobody's watching. Mm. And I think that's really catchy for a lot of reasons and particularly mm -hmm. the he's watching bit but I what sticks with me is the culture is what you do bit yeah and so before I started this I was in academia I studied you know behavioral economics around <laughs> gender and racial biases and negotiations and stuff like that but um culture is what you do just really stuck with me because he's kind of right culture is built on the behaviors mm -hmm. of the people in the organization mm -hmm. and it, it's kind of a cycle right like you the behaviors define the culture and then the culture that is built by those behaviors reinforces mm -hmm. further behaviors. And so while I think you can try to assess what your values are from day one, mm -hmm. the way that you behave with that first hire, like Lisa was saying, and how you establish that relationship mm -hmm. and the way you will reinforce the way that, that hire behaves with the next hire, right. and the next future hires. And as long as you're embodying those behaviors and being really cognizant of what those behaviors are doing, I think that's that's how you can kind of maintain whatever culture it is that you're trying to look for. And if you're looking to change that culture, then you need to change your behaviors. Yeah. And it's also probably a good call out to just to when you're assessing if a company's culture seems legit, like if they say one thing, like we have great work-life balance and, you know, maternity and paternity leave. And then when you look at what they're actually doing, does that match up? That might be a good way to assess mm -hmm. culture. Uh, Lisa, I'm sorry, where was I interrupting you? No, not at all. I was totally agreeing with you, Paige. And I, I think all the points that were made were, were really, really good. I think um, to think that setting your culture and your cultural tenets and your behavioral tenets on day one and never revisiting them and, and thinking that they're not mm -hmm. going to change over time. That's totally unrealistic. You know, your culture is a living, breathing thing. So as you hire more people, your culture is going to shift. It's going to adapt. And if it's not, then you've got a problem. There's a real mm -hmm. disconnect because those behaviors, those core values, your vision, your mission, all of those things tied directly into culture. Mm -hmm. And if it's not evolving over time, then there's something being missed. And that's that you'll see that in other things, you know, you'll see that in turnover, you'll see that in difficulty with onboarding and acclimation into a new organization. Yeah. So it's really important to keep in mind that that culture and the associated behaviors and values should be revisited on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. as the goals of the business change, mm -hmm. as the population changes, that should, it should always be evolving, always adapting. Mm -hmm. Lisa, do you have any advice about like when it's time to do a check-in like that? Is it a, is it a, like a cyclical every six months sort of thing? Or is it like, okay, we just added 20 new employees. It's probably time to do a check-in. Um, I, you know, Paige, that's, that's a tough question to answer. I think it's up to the organization to um, be listening all the time and understanding um, you know, kind of the, how the level of engagement is impacted with your employees. Um, the way to monitor that regularly is to have your employees really take ownership in the culture. Um, so it's something that I would want my employees to constantly be monitoring mm -hmm. because they're the ones on the front line interacting with customers. They're mm -hmm. the front lines prospecting. They're in it day to day. 
So really having the employees be a great way to gauge when we need to recheck and reset mm -hmm. um, or in any of those behavioral tenants, that's really, really important. Yeah. Um, so when you are entering this period of, of high growth, whether it be like from five people to 10 people or, you know, 10 people to 40 people, um, what are some of those tactics to assess what you're doing with culture and also implement it on like from going from 10 people to 40 people and making sure it still fits when you've reached that growth? Does anyone else want to jump in there? I don't want to be the only one talking. No, I think it, this is more for you guys that are sort of experts in culture. I'm, I'm a big, but I don't think it's my strong point. And I don't mm -hmm. think, in, and, uh, I think a lot of times you see uh, startups founded with like two founders mm -hmm. uh, because they have different skill sets that they bring to it. And I found within Tower, when we really started to take off was when we had somebody come in that was actually really interested in people and HR and stuff like that and developing company culture. And so that brought in, you know, good people and allowed us to really uh, take off and sort of rocket ship growth where we didn't have that before. It was just strategy and here's the correct business decision and doing this. And when we lost that, we sort of lost our way a little bit. We're trying to find our way back there. So I think it's a, it's a critical thing. But I mean, you guys have the expertise in this. I'm just sort of uh, yeah. playing playing with fire here and seeing what burns and what doesn't burn. There's a there's a question that actually came in for you, Stefan. Um, when you have a particularly unique company culture, like your five hour experiment, does it ever become distracting in hiring? Like people hearing, oh, they have this five hour work day, and that becomes the reason they want to join the company, not exactly because they just really want to work for the company. Yeah, I mean, there, were, there definitely became two groups of people that were uh, applying to the company. There were people that get it, got it. Like we were trying to attract people that work at three times the speed of everybody else. And when we rolled it out, we said, OK, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. straight through five hours. Um, and if you can't figure out how to be as productive as you were before, you'll be fired. So we put pressure on them at the same time we did this. So we wanted it to be a high pressure, like productivity focused thing, mm -hmm. kind of the, uh, the same motivations an entrepreneur has. But we started to get, we got that group, but we were already getting that group before. I don't think it, it really affected our ability to, to um, hire people. Uh, but the other group we got was, and we, we um, one of our five hour techniques was for interviews. Um, when you sent in an application, we had you do a video cover letter. So you'd have to video yourself and do some kind of creative thing and just sort of tell us about yourself. Just saved us a lot of time. So we didn't have to bring people in, right? And uh, you, would, you would see this person with their video um, you know, on their couch, like, oh, God, I wish, like, people had invented this five-hour workday, like, a long time ago. I mean, this is the greatest thing, you know, and they got chips over here, and, and you're just like, no, that's not the person we're looking for. <laughs> so we definitely got those two groups. So there was, there was negative to it, for sure. Yeah, interesting. Um, but, yeah, Lisa, I, this might be a good question for you as someone in the HR space, but going back to um, just the tactics you might – um, offer up to someone who is in like a startup environment who is quickly growing. Um, and maybe you started with like, like we said, your, your values may have started here, but now that you kind of are representing and working with a lot more people, they might have to change. So what mm -hmm. tactics do you give to the leadership to uh, maybe, maybe check in with those folks or like see what, see where, what areas need some pros and grows? Um, so I think, um, Paige, just coming back to trying to think about the, the best way to answer this question. So um, once you have uh, that culture defined and you've defined the behaviors that represent the culture, that's really important. And that's something that a lot of companies miss where you put out there, this is our culture, but then you don't define using very real examples yeah. of what that means, what the behaviors are that are associated and reinforce your desired culture state. If you don't take the time to define that, then you're never, the employees are never going to get it. So right. coming up with a, a standard messaging campaign around here is our culture and having regular reinforced messaging around, here's a great example of one of our colleagues who exemplified our culture uh, just yesterday mm -hmm. uh, with one of our customers. So constantly backing it up with examples that exemplify that behavior um, is really, really important. Mm -hmm. uh, and that 
uh, also just helps put it into perspective for everyone. So you can measure the effectiveness. Are we abiding by um, our culture and our core values and by the behaviors and how we represent ourselves? Um, but having a constant stream of messaging, examples, and sharing and celebrating when there's something to celebrate. Yeah. So anytime um, you see that, you know, caught in the act of exhibiting our culture, mm -hmm. um, that should be celebrated company wide by everyone, not just managers and leaders, but by peers. Mm -hmm. And we constantly be reinforcing the right behaviors. That's yeah. really, really important. Yeah, that's so true. I feel like I I'm, I'm not a big fan of like real buzzword terms. Um, and I feel like every company, you know, describes themselves as collaborative. Every company describes themselves as innovative. Right. They're all core to our, you know, values, whatever. Mm -hmm. But without saying like collaborative in that we do this exactly. Um, what does that even mean? So yeah, that's a great yeah. call out. Um, is there right. something? Yeah, I just wanted to add like, I, I mean, I agree a lot with what Lisa was saying, but I want to emphasize in particular just I think because of my whole academic background of like just the importance of measuring that mm -hmm. over and over again. Try and that goes back to asking people about their experiences of those behaviors. So if you're trying to create, say, a an innovative culture, right? Mm -hmm. Part of your value for that might be psychological safety. But what does that even mean? And so asking people questions like, mm -hmm. can you take a risk without without fear of yeah. backlash. Can you disagree with the prevailing opinion without people thinking you don't belong? Can you uh, can you make a mistake without it being unreasonably held over you? Mm -hmm. um, asking those kinds of questions and like you know if you're in a if you're in a phase of growing from you know five people to ten people, you might just ask people directly those kinds of questions or even yeah. have someone else ask those or something like that mm -hmm. if you're in a company that's growing from 100 people to 200 people then you can send out a survey and get quantitative data on that mm -hmm. to try and understand to what extent different people feel differently about different aspects of that culture mm -hmm. and whether you're act actually reflecting those values the other thing is that if you haven't done this yet and you're already you've already gotten to like some sort of bigger level mm -hmm. you can try to understand you can try to define those behaviors, ask people about it. And then there are all kinds of analyses that you can do to try and find out, are these actually leading to the culture that we want to create? Yeah. So you can see like, if, if you have a culture where you're trying to say, I don't know, we are a culture, we are a, we are an, a, an, a, a culture that appreciates accountability. Mm -hmm. And you can see if people feel like they're experiencing things like microaggressions or something. Mm -hmm. then how much of that is related to whether or not they believe the company is accountable. And then you yeah. can see that, oh, okay, X behavior is driving X outcome. And we're seeing that, you know, the X outcome is not really happening. So that's the behavior that we need to change. Yeah. Um, and I think it just, it just like reinforcing that message of like, you need to need to ask people repeatedly mm -hmm. so that you can make sure that you're creating the culture that you want. Yeah. Um, so we have been in a pandemic for more than a year, um, which means a lot of us have been working remotely um, for that time where you're not physically in the same place as your coworkers. And that has definitely impacted company culture. Um, mm -hmm. So I would love to know, you know, at your own organizations, how has the pandemic impacted how you think about culture, how you implement it, do you, how do you stay connected, et cetera? Um, I'm happy to jump in on that page. Um, the biggest impact for us, because we have done a lot of hiring in the last uh, year during the pandemic, mm -hmm. has been onboarding. How do you onboard a new employee yeah. when you, you don't get to meet them in person and really build that relationship? That has really been a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, what I've seen work in a lot of organizations in the last 12 months has been um, you know, bringing back the old mentorship programs um, you know, uh, making sure that as new hires come into the organization, um, who's who's their cultural ambassador, right? Who can we tie, you know, put into with this team member that may not necessarily work in the same department as them that's going to help them understand 
this is how we do things. This is how we interact with one another. But really, that's solely responsible for training and onboarding from a cultural perspective. And you can do that with legacy employees that have been there from the beginning. Yeah. Um, and also bring in some, you know, newer members of the organization. But you got to you have to make sure that that acclimation period is happening. And during COVID, that was really, really hard because I can't take your lunch. Right. You know, I can't sit down with you and show you around and give you an opportunity to meet other team members on the organization. That that is really, really difficult. So um, and, you know, honestly, like my husband walking in the middle of my webinar because I didn't put a sign on my door. Um, that's kind of the new COVID, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we had to adapt to mm -hmm. and learn to adjust to is that, look, there's it's real life and, mm -hmm. and being able to understand that it's very different mm -hmm. and acknowledge that it's not the way it was two years ago. Right. I think from, from my perspective, our company has been, so we're in a weird place because our company has been virtual since the company started. Mm -hmm. We've never had physical office space. Um, and I'm the only one in the US, everybody else is in, oh, okay. in the UK. Yeah. Oh, gosh. So not only has, every, but everybody's always worked from home. That's mm -hmm. just been our company since the beginning. And so when this shifted, um, it was more interesting because we couldn't, I mean, we couldn't see our clients in person, which was, a new thing um, and it kind of makes it difficult to build those relationships somehow. But one of the things that we used to do pre pandemic and then kind of reinforced mm -hmm. more was we would build in those kind of social times to be with each other. So, you virtual know, we, happy hour, like everybody has become yeah, a so like virtual happy hour or like we had, vir we always had these virtual retreats. We had in-person ones as well, but mm -hmm. now we're doing these virtual retreats where part of it is, like literally just hanging out and watching, doing like a Netflix watch party together. Mm -hmm. Or um, we did uh, we did a cocktail and mocktail class at for our Christmas party together, where someone mm -hmm. like a bartender came on and taught us how to make. And they made, everybody got a shipment of all the ingredients mm -hmm. with the right, the right amounts to make different mocktails and cocktails and things like that. Just to so th I think those kinds of virtual social events that kind of replace the, you know, chatting at someone's cubicle or walking across the hall to have lunch with someone. Like, I think it kind of helps replace that a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think the difficult, one of the most difficult things we've seen with some of our clients is that um, it's especially difficult, I think, in, in startups and high growth companies because you are so involved in the company. You spend so much time with it. Yeah. It's a part of who you are. It's a part of your identity. And if go, getting up and going to work and spending a lot of time there, not coming home till late or, you know, something like that is part of who you are, then, and that's being ripped away from you. How do you, it's not just about maintaining the company culture. It's about maintaining mm -hmm. individual identity. Mm -hmm. And that, I, I think acknowledging that and understanding that aspect of it and even verbally acknowledging that with each other can be really, really helpful. And so especially when leaders are able to express some of that vulnerability, mm -hmm. I think it helps create that sense that we're all in the same boat and we're all we're all struggling with this. Have you all found that there are things about like this current remote culture that will maintain even if you even when it's you know safe to go into the office, whatever, like how what has remote culture taught you about like what's going going forward you're gonna keep implementing? I mean, I'll chime in there because we didn't really do remote culture um, with COVID. We going into it a couple months prior, we had five employees and then we were we were downsizing, right sizing. So we got down to three employees, myself and two people. And like when a container comes in, like we all got to unload the container. Mm -hmm. Stuff's got to ship out every day. So we didn't really have the option of doing remote, remote work. Um, you know, in San Diego, I had to drive past a police line and they would chase me down sometime. And they're saying, like, you can't leave your house. And I'm like, look, I'm paying rent from the city here. Uh, they're still collecting yeah. rent. I need to work. We got 3,000 square feet. There's just a couple of us in there. Like, we're going to work. Mm -hmm. And we just, we didn't have an option. And mm -hmm. I sort of told everybody, like, yeah, we can all work from home, but we're going to go out of business. So we, we don't have that. And I've honestly never been a big fan of uh, work from home. Uh, especially in small teams because even when like one person is 
uh, mm -hmm. sick or whatever, and then another person's out to lunch, if there's nobody here, like mm -hmm. we don't have coverage. In larger companies, you have coverage for things. Right. And we just we just don't have that luxury. And, and the other thing, and we've experimented with the workday a lot with our with our five hour workday and stuff like this, um, is the idea of sort of, you know, a bunch of smart people in a room together, like, uh, you know, having a conversation in the hallway or something like that. Just this idea of uh, sort of idea sex that mm -hmm. you bounce this off this person, this person bounces off this person. And I think that's why you, you hire smart people and put them in the same room. As mm -hmm. soon as you go to remote, I think it's very difficult to, uh, to get that same type of thing. So I am like vehemently opposed to remote work, especially in a small company. And so I sort of force people to come in. And I think this pandemic has given us an excuse to go to remote work. And I think employees love for employers to get their employees to come back. Yeah. I think some employees, and I've talked to a few people on this, they're saying back to that company if they're not going to allow uh, to work for a different company. So it's uh, Pandora's box has been opened. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think there's going to be some mm -hmm. good. Oh, yeah. I've definitely heard the same thing. Um, I have friends even who have said like, if my company makes me, forces me to come back like full time or mm -hmm. something like that, or even at all, they're like, I'll go somewhere else. Um, and that's- yeah, right. Right. You're saying after it's safe to go back in, they're just like, oh, I really don't want to work in an office. And now yeah, I have correct. the right not to, I'm going to exercise that right. Right. Yeah, it's, I mean, we've shown that it's possible. So if you want to keep people, I think that'll become, Moving forward, I think that that will become a big like negotiating tactic um, for folks. Um, but Lisa, um, what I would love to hear about how COVID has impacted your company and also how you're how you are advising people right now. So um, it was funny when you were talking. I was frantically looking for the stat that I just came up came across um, earlier this week. So this is interesting, Paige. I'll talk about this and then I'll answer the question. 30% of employees are saying that they will change jobs if forced to return to the office on a permanent basis. Mm -hmm. I just saw that stat this week and it might've been in a technically article. Um, I'll have to find it. Um, and then another interesting stat, and this should be a big um, indicator that it's time to look at your culture if you haven't already. 52% of workers expect to look for a new job in 2021. That's up from 35% in 2019 and 2020. Mm -hmm. So there is a definitely um, a shift happening and companies need to be ready for that. Mm -hmm. The only reason a company is going to stay, an employee is going to stay with your company, a lot of that is driven by culture and it's a lot of that feeling of belonging to your company. Mm -hmm. So I think for, for us, especially the biggest change we had during COVID, um, I got to know all of our employees really, really well on a personal level. Um, there were insights into people's lives that I was not aware of and that a lot of companies were not aware of. And there were a lot of managers who were not equipped mm. to have very real and difficult conversations with their teams. Um, and that's, you know, a lot of talk around wellness, a lot of talk around mental well-being, resilience, um, you know, this, I have to be online and sit on Zoom after Zoom after Zoom for 14 hours a day. Um, how is that impacting, you know, kids uh, that are also at home schooling? There were so many things that happened in, in the last 12 months during the pandemic. And if your managers weren't equipped and ready to have those conversations, you were in big trouble. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of, well, I don't know how to respond. So therefore I'm just not gonna interact with my team member. Mm -hmm. That's the typical response, right? Mm -hmm. So we made sure in our organization that we shared a lot, if you were comfortable to do so, about how you were managing through. Mm -hmm. And that was at the end of each week, celebrating at least one thing that we were really proud of this week. And then we also encouraged people to share, was there anything that you really struggled with this week? And when you just ask that simple question, there was so much feedback and it got very real. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm depressed. Like I can't see my family. I don't know what the next, next thing is going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but that forced us to really focus on, okay, we need to make sure that we have the right benefits in place, um, that we are 
cognizant and aware that not everyone's going to respond at 6.30 in the morning right. uh, just because you're not driving to work. Um, we really had to be careful and just have a little more self-awareness mm -hmm. that people were really struggling. Mm -hmm. uh, and as, if you can't see them, you can't take them to lunch and you can't you know, have go to happy hour and be like, hey, let's all relax together, then that even compounded the issue even more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great call, Lisa. I actually just yesterday or the day before had a chat with someone at a software company here in Philly about culture um, and about how he was feeling about culture. And especially after um, that interesting base camp um, policy came out, just basically saying we're not going to be talking about social or um, political issues at all um, on our um on our home server essentially um and then a third of the employees left and i think that that lisa like what you were saying is a great example of mm -hmm. we're going to be watching now that you know the economy and life seems a little bit more shored up than it did you know six months ago people are going to be looking for a new job and they're going to be looking for the way that their company reacted to the pandemic to you know racial justice movement last summer and ongoing that these will all be indicators to how folks are thinking about their company and company culture um, moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one last thing I definitely wanted to hit on before we um, said goodbye was um, a big issue or an obstacle, I guess, within the tech industry um, during high growth phases is suddenly realizing you need HR, suddenly realizing you should have like a diversity and inclusion policy, suddenly realizing like, oh, we have to care about these things like mental health, et cetera. So um, how do we do that? How do we, you know, ensure that this is done well? And how do we ensure that people actually care about it versus just thinking this is the thing we should do? You know, we have 40 employees now, we should think about this. So I have lots of thoughts on this, but yeah. I'm gonna try and summarize it, like really just distill it down. Um, so if you're trying to, when you're trying to think about these issues that are really coming up, and I think it does go back to, I mean, it, it does go back to like, how do you make sure that people in that your employees feel like they have value and mm -hmm. like their, the re the other aspects of their identities, other than being an employee at this workplace mm -hmm. are part of being an employee at this mm -hmm. workplace. And, um, and I think it goes down to like, are it goes back to what we were saying right at the beginning, are your behaviors matching up with what you say you value? And so I think there are, to develop that kind of a policy or that kind of a structure and a system and make sure that it's actually happening, there are kind of five key components about it. There's how much of that, of what you're talking about, your value mm -hmm. is actually embedded in your business strategy, mm -hmm. your overall strategy. Mm -hmm. It's not like DNI or HR is just something on the side. It's a part of your business strategy. Mm -hmm. And so how is that weaved throughout it? The second is around data. Are you capturing data about these topics about these things that you value and what is that telling you the third is around governance so who's actually going to be responsible mm -hmm. and accountable to making sure it actually happens that you're at, that whatever actions you want to put in place actually mm -hmm. happen and accountability is really the key part there the fourth is around leadership behaviors so how are you actually thinking about what these behaviors should be and how are you making sure that they are happening and then the fifth is about systems and processes. So how are you making sure that the behaviors that you've identified that are affiliated with your values are in line with whatever policies you have around hiring or procurement or team allocation or mm -hmm. you know whatever you're planning to do in that way? Yeah, that's it. Thank you for the really five point system. No, don't. don't. <laughs> So Paige, I would love to share in the chat yeah. an organization that we recently joined in Baltimore City called Baltimore Tracks. And look, I've been a part of a lot of initiatives over the years. Um, this one is actually working. So um, Baltimore Tracks, just to give you a little bit um, of background on them, um, their mission um, is to bring together leaders from local technology companies around Baltimore to commit to building a diverse workforce by facilitating dialogue, sharing resources and best practices around de uh, diversity and inclusion. 
and then taking action to ensure equitable and inclusive policies and practices at their respective companies. Mm -hmm. Well, this has taken off like wildfire um, in Baltimore and every tech company, whether it's a startup or established company is now part of Baltimore Tracks. But here's what's, so we meet monthly, it's a ginormous Zoom call. There's like a hundred mm -hmm. companies on there. Um, and one of the really cool things um, that we saw um, last month, there's a candidate sharing program mm -hmm. where if you come across a really awesome, diverse candidate, uh, you go to that candidate, you ask permission, and then you share that individual across the coalition of companies. So I did that with my intern that I've had for the last year. She just graduated from Salisbury University. And so I called her and I said, listen, I've got the opportunity to share now that you're graduating from college and you're moving on because, you know, this was an intern job. Um, do you want me to share your resume? across this organization and she was like, oh my gosh, would you? And I said, of course. So within a matter of weeks, she was being interviewed by 10 companies um, across the Baltimore Tracks Coalition. And she was just offered a job by R2I, which is a, a huge, um, really best class digital marketing firm. She's gonna be a full-time marketing coordinator starting on June 1st. That's amazing. Like it actually worked. You shared it. Everyone, you know, she had all these interviews mm -hmm. and she ended up getting a job as a result. And that was a great opportunity that she otherwise would not have had, had this coalition and this group of companies not come together and said, listen, we're going to share diverse candidates and we're going to really start making an impact. And that was a great example. I was super excited about it. Cool. Yeah, um, I think that my colleague Stephen um, just reported on that coalition. In the there we go. Um, awesome. Great. I want to just note that we are basically at time. Um, so we talked about a lot of things um, during this session, but some of the high level things are you know, culture is great to keep in mind at the start of your company, but you're definitely going to have to reassess as you grow and, you know, change. Um, and that it both comes from the founders of the organization, but also the people who work there. They're bringing culture to the table as well. Um, and Rafi, can you remind me of the quote was culture is what you do? Culture is what you do when nobody's watching. When nobody's watching. <laughs> A little ominous, but also correct. So <laughs> um, I want to thank you all so much for participating in um, our Introduce conference. And um, maybe if anyone wants to get in touch, um, you could drop your emails or LinkedIn's in the chat. Um, so if folks have follow-up questions or anything like that, they can stay in touch. Um, thanks so much, everyone. Thank, thank you, Kate. This was super fun. Yeah. All right. Cool. Have a great rest of your day. Okay. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.